How did Halo go from this to this? And how can a game made by one dude in his bedroom have a larger player base than Halo, Call of Duty, and Battlefield combined? To answer these questions, we first need to understand why AAA studios have taken all of their desire to make fun games and just thrown it out the window. Did you guys not have phones? From what I found, it all started a few decades back when the video game industry really became mainstream with the release of Space Invaders. This game took the world by storm and really put video games on the map. See, companies were scrambling to get a piece of the growing video game industry. And the man who kicked everything off was Space Invaders' only developer, Tomohiro Nishikado. See, the thing is, back in the 70s and early 80s, most games were made by one or a few developers. You couldn't pack much into a whopping four kilobyte game cartridge after all. So games were simple in design, but because developers couldn't lean on graphics or music to track a lot of players, games developed at this time really had to be fun. And Tomohiro understood this perfectly. In an interview a few years ago, Tomohiro even had this to say. Yes, I developed Space Invaders by myself. In those days, that was the standard for games to be made by one person. Today, however, that work and development is so divided and specialized that one person can't really see the whole picture. And in that sense, I think developers need to go back to the beginning. Although Tomohiro doesn't fully explain what he means by beginning, what I interpret his words to mean is to get back to where each team member understands the vision of the game they are working to create. The video game industry wouldn't be the same without Tomohiro, and I believe he's a huge reason why gaming is what it is today. Space Invaders kept Activated millions around the world, causing people to fall in love with video games and ushering in the golden age of the AAA game. Over the next few years, technology for making games improved drastically, and games became more sophisticated, requiring more people for development. You couldn't just make a game on your own anymore. The industry was maturing, and teams needed all sorts of talent and specialization to make games work. Game studios began expanding at an incredible rate to create more advanced games. So as the 80s and 90s progressed, we see less and less solo developers like Tomohiro produce seen these great games. Bungie is a great example of this. They only had three employees in the early 90s, and together the three of them went on to create a few successful games. Operation Desert Storm, Minotaur the Labyrinth of Crete, and Pathways into Darkness. But they were relatively small and simple. A few more employees were added over the years, and the company grew. Most of the employees were college students with nothing but the desire to make fun games, probably inspired by developers like Tomohiro. As Chris Butcher put it, The culture of Bungie is pretty simple. There's a bunch of college kids who wanted to drink beer and eat pizza and like do amazing cool stuff in their basements. Ten years after the launch of Bungie, 40 people were doing just that. And from the scrappy team nourished by pizza and beer, Halo was born. Obviously, it exploded in popularity. It felt like Halo was the only reason most people bought an Xbox. Microsoft, of course, loved it. So more money, talent, and resources were just thrown at Bungie to make Halo 2. But even though the team grew in size, the culture was still the same. The Bungie team was passionate about making the best game, and man, they did just that. Halo 2 was released and people lost their minds over it. I mean, it was national news. With a successful launch of Halo 2, Bungie was on a pedestal and people couldn't wait to see what would come next. 2007 finally rolled around and if you thought the hype for Halo 2 was big, Halo 3 was even bigger. The multiplayer, the campaign, and the community were on a whole new level. <laughs> no! <laughs> it was the pinnacle of gaming. So Bungie did it. They had set out to create some of the best games of our era and were ready to throw in the towel after Halo 3. The studio had achieved what it set out to do. They were ready to move on. It was really important to us to end on a high note with Halo 3. But of course, Microsoft couldn't let that happen. Halo was the golden goose they weren't done with it. So Bungie was asked to create one more Halo game before leaving Microsoft, and that game was Halo Reach. Halo Reach was a beautiful game. The campaign was emotional, and the forge was unreal. That said, I don't think Halo Reach was as good as Halo 3. Right, don't get me wrong, I think it's a phenomenal game. I mean, it made $200 million on its launch day. To many, it was peak Halo. However, for me, I believe Halo Reach wasn't made with as much passion as the previous Halos because the team had already told the Halo story they wanted to tell. Players were pretty sad when Bungie moved on from Halo, but excited to see what they would do next. And as we watched Bungie give its farewell, Microsoft, behind the scenes, handed the Halo mantle to a new studio, 343. 
Well, only a year had passed since Reach, and it was announced that Halo 4 would be coming out in 2012. At the time, most of us didn't think about Halo 4 being made by another developer as being too big of a deal. We were just excited for more Halo. And on launch day, the hype clearly had a big impact on Halo 4 because it made $220 million. Players were eager to continue the story of Master Chief, but something was different. The gameplay was different. It just felt off. I mean, it looked like Halo, but it didn't feel like Halo. And only after a few months in, players started dropping like flies, flocking back to Halo 3 and Reach. At the time, players thought that maybe it was just a fluke. 343 was learning the ropes and got caught up in that Call of Duty hype. Halo 5 will be different. 343 learned their lesson. Halo 5 rolls around and it makes $400 million in its first 24 hours. So people loved it, right? Nope. No co-op campaign, overly aggressive and competitive multiplayer, and no content at launch. How can a company screw up so many things that their predecessors, Bungie, had already paved the path for? Players at this point just hoped 343 was going to learn from their mistake. They would listen to the community this time and release a game that players really want. Bonnie Ross said 343 will do better and promised there will be a co-op campaign this time. The next Halo will be different. Um, and I would say for any FPS going out forward, we will always have split screen in going forward. Well, that wasn't included in launch and they said it was coming. And now inexplicably, it has been canceled. Split screen co-op has been canceled in Halo Infinite. We have had to make the difficult decision not to ship campaign split screen co-op and take the resources that we would use on that and go after this list and all these other things that we're going to talk about in just a sec. How can a company with six years of development, $500 million, make a game with such little content, so many bugs, a garbage progression system, and just be okay to release it? How can 343 screw up this much? It just doesn't make sense. We've heard many answers from the community. 343 didn't earn it. 343 doesn't like Halo. 343 is trying to turn a party game into a competitive game. All valid answers. But you would think that if 343 really cared, they would figure out how to make a good Halo game. However, the main reason why 343 just can't make a good Halo game is because something about the company is fundamentally broken. Let's compare 343 to Bungie. So Bungie's entire company culture revolved around making the best game possible. This drove them to make Halo bigger and better each release. 343's focus, on the other hand, revolves around money and how they can make more of it. Every Halo game they release has less content and has gotten worse. Even indie games don't have problems with creating a progression system, yet multiverses and split gate just fucking blow Halo Infinite out of the water. You don't even have a progression system. It's easy to see the difference in quality between these two studios, but it's not as easy to see why there's a difference. And this is why 343 doesn't have the capacity to make a good game. The leaders of the company don't put quality of the game first. They put money first. And this culture of money first thinking trickles down to everyone. Even if you are a 343 developer that just loves Halo. Any reward as an employee only comes when your work is furthering the goal of making more money, not the best game. Yes. And all the details are I love in. it. This is the first time? Oh, yeah. so you're, you're really hoping it doesn't crash, right? That's uh, fantastic. Now, I haven't answered a very important question. Why wouldn't 343 prioritize making the best game? Won't that make you more money as a company? At first glance, this seems obvious. Make a good game, and you'll make money, right? Well, kind of. If you make a great game, and you have a marketing budget, then sure, you're bound to sell copies. But large AAA companies discovered a way to make more money than ever before without necessarily making a great game. Live service games. You may have noticed that an increasing number of AAA games launched live service games with battle passes and content roadmaps. Why? They make a lot more money after launch day thanks to microtransactions. You no longer just make money when people purchase your game. It's not one and done. You can make money now during its entire lifespan. The developer is inclined to continue supporting the game and its community long after launch. But it doesn't help that 99 out of 100 live service games coming out these days are only that way because executives are rushing out unfinished products and most of these games just end up in the AAA graveyard next to Anthem. Still, there are a few games that have found long-term success with this model. League of Legends, World of Warcraft, Destiny 2. But I would argue that the success of these these live service games have hindered the creation of sequels long overdue. It's been 20 years since Warcraft 3 came out. 
20 years. Where in the world is Warcraft 4? The reason Blizzard hasn't made it yet, despite Warcraft 3 being so successful, is because they haven't figured out how to make it a live service. So here we sit in 2022, having watched our favorite IPs disappear or just be bastardized by the companies we once revered. What do we do now? For every bad AAA game released, 10 great indie games are released simultaneously. I mean, why is the Untitled Goose game the best stealth game I've ever played? My boo! My hey! I'll just take this. <laughs> <laughs> Why is Hollow Knight, with its dreary atmosphere and tight gameplay, the best Metroidvania? And why is a roguelite indie game about escaping hell over and over sound simple, but play just so perfectly? It's not because these indie developers are the most talented or have oodles of cash on hand. It's because they did one thing and one thing only. They followed the fun. That game about escaping hell over and over is the breakout phenomenon Hades. And I can't think of a game or a game studio more focused than them on following the fun. Why? Because Supergiant Games spent two years with Hades in early access making sure every detail of the game was what the community wanted. Two years. I know you hear early access and like live service, you imagine all the train wrecks over the years. But Hades and Supergiant did it right. Hades creative director Greg Cassavan said this about its two year early access. With Hades, we identified that we wanted to make an early access game first and foremost to see what we could build in partnership with our community. So the plan was to do early access from the get go. Supergiant wanted Hades to be in the hands of the community, not for the quick buck like these other games, but because Supergiant wanted to build a fun game that the community would love. This culture, this mentality of following the fun is what sets apart Supergiant Games and a variety of other indie studios from AAA. Us gamers really only want one thing, to play a fun game alone or with our buddies. And indie studios really understand this concept because they're gamers too. Indie studios these days are reminiscent of Tomohiro or the original Bungie team. Solo or small team developers who are focused on building something they or the community actually want to play. We seem to have come full circle. Yes, new tools have made it easier than ever to make games, and yes, Steam has made publishing games incredibly simple. But that's not the main reason we are entering the golden age of indie games. If it was, the 100th Minecraft copycat would be rolling in money right now. The reason why indie studios are dominating the video game industry is because because indie studios have what AAA studios don't have, the right culture and a desire to follow the fun. No matter what, that's who Bungie is. We're always gonna make what we wanna make and we're gonna make it a game that we wanna play.